Good afternoon, everybody, and hope you're having a good Friday. Obviously, today it's a big day for the state of Louisiana as the stay home order has been lifted and we move into phase one. I'm actually confident uh, that we can do this in a responsible way that uh, adequately balances the competing interest of public health on the one hand and reengaging more of our economy and getting businesses open and people back to work and patrons back in stores and so forth. Um, I think we can do this and keep cases down uh, and manageable if people will do what we've asked them to do. Uh, but it is incumbent upon them. I think all of the people in Louisiana to understand, as we've said all along, that they have a role to play and to please follow the guidance that we've put in place. Um, you know, this, is, this is one of those places where even though I'm confident, we're going to watch it very, very carefully because uh, as, I've, as I've said, um, and anyone who's been in the military will understand this, you, you never want to fight for, bleed, and die for the same terrain twice. Um, and so we don't want to go back to having the kind of case counts and case growth um, that we had just several weeks ago. Uh, obviously, we want to save lives. We want to move forward and not backwards. And one of the worst things that can happen for the economy, by the way, is if we have to uh, slow down, put on the brakes, or potentially go backwards by putting more restrictions in in order to address uh, spikes in cases. So we're, we're looking for business owners to be responsible, to follow the guidance. We're looking for individual members uh, of the public to do the same thing. <clears throat> Today, uh, we are reporting 348 new cases across the state of Louisiana. Uh, that brings us to a total of 33,837, as you can see from the video monitor. We have 5,601 new tests uh, that we're reporting today. Unfortunately, we are also reporting 31 new deaths across the state from COVID-19, complications related to COVID-19. Uh, and the total number of deaths now is 2,382. Um, the good news today is that we have 102 less patients in the hospital uh, who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. We're down to 1,091 patients. Uh, and we have eight less patients on ventilators. Uh, we have a total of 130 Two. As of today, we've completed more than 253,000 tests in the aggregate since the beginning of this public health emergency. Uh, while we're on the subject of testing, uh, I really do want to recognize uh, our state public health lab. Uh, they've been doing exceptional work throughout uh, and in the middle of responding to this pandemic and working around the clock to increase testing. Uh, and testing capacity and to run the tests that they they have to run and so forth. The lab also underwent its national accreditation inspection. It's the single most important standard for laboratories around uh, the country. Uh, and in addition to passing on the first visit with zero findings, the inspector noted that he has conducted approximately 400 assessments and he has and this is a quote, never seen a lab perform so well during the initial accreditation assessment. Uh, so I want to congratulate them and thank them for their great work and ask them to please keep it up. And we should all be thankful of these for these lab uh, techs and professionals for everything uh, that they are doing. I'm also happy to report that 298 contact tracers have completed their training this week. Uh, by tomorrow, we should have 290 uh, in place uh, in working on contact tracing. Obviously, we're still seeing COVID-19 cases uh, in communities across the state of Louisiana. And so any one of us can receive a call uh, from a contact tracer. It's important that if you do receive such a call that you participate. Uh, the call will come from the following phone number, 877-766-2130. 877-766-2130. Uh, uh, contracted companies that's running these contact tracing uh, operations, they will be the ones on that number, so please answer.
And you should know that contact tracing is not a new process developed for COVID-19. It's been in place for many decades. Uh, and in fact, it's been used here in Louisiana on a number of occasions. Um, it was used with respect to smallpox to suppress deadly diseases like tuberculosis and hepatitis A. The identity of the persons testing positive uh, is never revealed. I was asked this yesterday on, um, I guess it was a town hall meeting online with the advocate um, editor and the editor of the uh, Times Picayune, uh, whether a contact tracer would tell the person they're calling who it was that had come into contact them, with them that had tested positive. The answer to that is no. Um, all information given to contact tracers is treated with the same level of confidentiality and security uh, as you would expect and receive at a doctor's office or a hospital. I also have a little more good news to report today, and that is that the USDA Food and Nutrition Service has approved our application for the PEBT program. Uh, that stands for the Pandemic Electronic Benefits Transfer uh, Program. It provides benefits for students who receive free or reduced price school meals. So parents will be able to apply beginning on Monday, that's this coming Monday, May the 18th, on the Louisiana Department of Education website, louisianabelieves.com, louisianabelieves.com. This benefit amounts to $285 per child, which is $5.70 per day uh, that the schools have been closed. And I think it's 50 days, and that's how you come up with that, from March uh, 16th to May the 22nd, which was the last day school was scheduled. It makes up for the cost of breakfast and lunch that they would have received had they been at school. And obviously, the parents can then use that uh, funding and, and make sure that these children do have access to nutrition. More than 600,000 students are potentially eligible. Uh, grades peak, or I should say, pre-K through 12. Once the Department of Education confirms eligibility, the Department of Children and Family Services will issue the card. Shifting gears for a moment, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the potential for severe weather this weekend. And in fact, across southeast Louisiana last night, we experienced uh, severe weather. Uh, and I've spoken to three parish presidents, those being the parishes of St. Tammany, St. Charles, and Tanchebaho, uh, all of whom told me they received extraordinary amounts of rainfall, somewhere in the neighborhood of 13, 14, 15 inches of rain over about seven hours yesterday that caused a significant amount of flooding, uh, and that's still being assessed, and, and um, the folks at GOSEP are working with those parishes. Um, unfortunately, the rain is going to continue, and we don't have optimal conditions for that area to drain into Lake Pontchartrain because the wind is blowing out of the south and southeast, uh, and because of all the rain that has fallen further north, uh, the creeks and tributaries are actually continue to rise. And so we obviously hope we don't get uh, significant amounts of rain until the water that has already fallen and accumulated has an opportunity to drain out uh, but if, if more rain does come uh, too soon in significant amounts, obviously that's going to exacerbate uh, the flooding problem there. We also had one, uh, I think, tornado reported. I don't have uh, damage reports from that tornado. In fact, the parish president, uh, Mike Cooper from St. Tammany, tells me he's not sure that it actually touched the ground. Uh, but we do want everyone to be aware that there is an elevated risk for severe weather this weekend. It could include flash flooding uh, in many areas, especially those areas where the ground is already saturated and the floodwaters have not yet receded. Uh, the National Weather Service says to expect about two inches of rain in some areas, but I'm not sure they predicted the 13, 14, or 15 inches of rain that actually fell yesterday, so we should all be aware. Uh, wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour are also possible, and obviously there is a some uh, limited potential for uh, tornadoes. So please stay weather aware. Keep your phones and devices charged and on. Download the free Alert FM app. It's offered by the state uh, so that you can get emergency alerts. Uh, monitor your local media and listen for guidance from your local emergency officials. If you uh, are driving and you come upon water standing in the road and you're not absolutely certain that it's shallow enough that you can safely proceed, don't proceed through the water. 
Uh, that is how we experience uh, most of the fire fatalities and flooding. It's because of motorists. So we're asking people to be especially careful uh, with respect to that hazard. You can go to gosepsgetagameplan.org for more information. That's getagameplan.org on preparedness for this event and other threats, and it's always a good idea to do this. We're just two weeks away uh, from hurricane season, uh, and I saw earlier today where there's already a storm system out east of Florida that could potentially become a tropical storm, although at this point um, it looks like it does. It's going to uh, move uh, north and then back out into the Atlantic, uh, but it's obviously that time of year, so we're asking everybody to get a game plan. Finally, before I take questions, I want to congratulate all the graduates, high school graduates, um, college graduates of 2020, many of whom are taking part in virtual graduation ceremonies today or over the coming days. And I know this is not how you all envisioned uh, celebrating this particular milestone. And I apologize uh, for that. Uh, you are going to have a story to tell your children and grandchildren about for a, a long time. Um, but I want you to know that, that I and so many people are very, very proud of each and every one of you and your accomplishments. Um, and you know, I'm, I won't be delivering any commencement speeches this year, and I normally deliver several. And the one thing I want to tell, especially all the college graduates, is that the degree that you have just achieved empowers you uh, to make a real difference uh, in your family, in your community, in the state of Louisiana, uh, a real difference in this world. And because it's empowered you to be able to do that, uh, I think you're obligated to use it for that purpose. And so find ways, big and small, uh, to contribute, to make a difference. And it is never more important than it is right now. Uh, so know that Louisiana is proud of you uh, and that Louisiana has a very bright future because of each and every one of you. Now, uh, we'll get to a couple of questions. One, uh, Benny from Hayes, Louisiana, and he wants it to know why is it that casinos can open up Monday at 50% while everything else, including restaurants and bars, uh, can only open up at 25%. First of all, bars cannot open, period, unless they have an LDH food permit, in which case they can open up to the same extent as a restaurant. With respect to casinos and, and gaming establishments, they are limited to 25% occupancy. W they're also limited to no more than 50% of their gaming positions because that's how we make sure that within the establishment they are able to stay a safe distance and, and to social distance from one another, achieve that six foot uh, separation. And so in, in that regard, it's very consistent with all of the uh, guidance that we're giving to restaurants and to bars with LDH permits. 25% uh, of your occupancy, but then you have to make sure that within the uh, establishments you're able to achieve social uh, distancing. So it's not just that you have 50%, a limit of 50% of your uh, positions in the uh, casinos or, or so forth, but no two gaming positions that are contiguous to one another can be open. So you, you're going to have a gaming position that's open and the ones next to it will not be. Uh, and so we will achieve the social distancing. And so. For that, uh, for that reason, they are, the rules are very, very similar uh, for each of those. The reason it's Monday the 18th for these gaming establishments is because we, in addition to the proclamation, are requiring them to submit a plan that is approved by the Gaming Control Board. And they needed some time to receive, evaluate, and approve those plans and communicate that back to the establishments. And that's why the earliest that they will be able to open, should they receive that approved plan, will be Monday, uh, May the 18th. Second question comes from New Iberia. Uh, Bill wants to know, uh, during phase one, will the DMVs open up? Yes, as a matter of fact, they will. The offices of motor vehicle will start providing limited services at, I'm sorry, 11 locations across the state. Some of those activities and services include driver's license renewals, title transfers, uh, and the issuance of identification cards. Those 11 locations are Alexandria, Baton Rouge, Livingston, Mandeville, Monroe, Harvey, Homa, Lafayette, Lake Charles, New Orleans, and Shreveport. Uh, additional locations will come online and, and open 
over the coming days. Uh, still, customers are, are encouraged to use OMV online services when possible. Uh, that's one way that you can stay home, get your business done, uh, and be as safe as possible. Visit expresslane.org, expresslane.org for more information and details on the locations that will open on Monday. As you can see, as I normally do, I've got Dr. Alex B.U. here from the Department of Health, and he is here to address uh, or to answer any questions that you all may have, and I am open for questions at this time. Yes, sir. You said you're confident that uh, people are going to handle this in a responsible way. What leads you to that? Do you think people are just tired of the restrictions and therefore they're going to comply with the rules for phase one? Do you think they're more fearful of testing positive? Or, or just sort of what leads you to that? Well, I think it's, it's all of the above, but, but really the um, optimism in, is informed by the way Louisiana has responded uh, since the public health emergency started. Uh, and we've imposed restrictions uh, over time that ended up with the stay home order um, and, and now is given way to phase one. And, you know, it's not lost on me, it should not be lost on the people in Louisiana that we've made tremendous progress. Uh, just think back to where we were six or seven weeks ago. Um, and, and we had uh, the fastest rate of growth of, of cases anywhere in the country and, and I think anywhere in the world according to the data that we were seeing. Uh, and yet today here we are uh, moving forward uh, with a phase one reopening. Uh, and, and so that happened because the people of Louisiana took the stay at home order uh, seriously. Uh, they were responsible, they were safe, and we have greatly slowed the spread of the, the disease. Uh, and the number of people in our hospital and so forth. Now, there is still uh, a lot of COVID-19 in Louisiana, um, and, and we still have uh, people who are contracting the disease. Uh, some of them have to be hospitalized, and unfortunately, every single day we're reporting new deaths. Today, 31. Uh, but at the same time, we, we know that we've made progress, and that's because people um, complied with the orders. Uh, and, and we expect that they will continue to do that, especially when you understand that, that business owners, I believe, have a, have a significant economic interest in complying because they want their customers to feel safe. Otherwise, they're not going to get customers in the numbers that they need to maximize their opportunity uh, and, and so forth. And, and so I, I just, I'm optimistic, but we're, we're going to keep an eye on things uh, through the testing, through the contact tracing. Uh, and I hope we don't have to uh, put any more restrictions back in place or go backwards. Obviously, that, that would not be a good thing, uh, but, but I'm optimistic that that won't happen. Yes, sir. Governor, we've heard a lot about the possibility of a second wave of this virus coming in the fall. Does Louisiana anticipate that, and what does the planning look like in that event? Well, I, I guess I'm going to let Dr. B. you come up here. Um, I can tell you that we are aware that it's a possibility. Um, the degree to which uh, uh, people who are experts are, are certain that's going to happen, it varies depending on what expert that you speak to. Um, you only have to look back to the flu epidemic of 1918 to know, and of course that was influenza, it wasn't a coronavirus, um, but there was a, a very significant uh, outbreak in public health emergency in the spring. Uh, and then that fall, it came back, uh, and it was actually much worse. Uh, now, there's some differences, obviously, as I just mentioned, this is a coronavirus, it's not influenza. Uh, but secondly, we are not going to let our guard down. Uh, we expect uh, testing will continue in a robust fashion uh, all the way through the end of the year. Uh, we're going to be contact tracing. As you can uh, imagine, or you really don't have to imagine, you hear people saying all this all the time, we're not gonna get fully back to normal until sometime after a vaccine has been developed, proven safe and effective, mass produced, uh, and, then, and then used to confer immunity upon a, a significant uh, portion of, of our population. Uh, so between now and this fall, uh, I'm not sure that that vaccine is gonna be available. Uh, that would be an accelerated timeline, and I know the president made an announcement about that today, about what the goals are. Um, but so, so we are aware that, that this fall, uh, 
that this could come back. And, and by the way, I hate to even use that terminology because we don't expect it to leave us between now uh, and this fall. And so that may present an unrealistic expectation um, uh, on the part of people who hear that. So we think, we think the coronavirus is gonna be with us, uh, hopefully at not at the levels we're seeing today. Uh, and then whether it spikes back up in the fall, it remains to be seen. I will only tell you that, that, that we will be doing everything that we can to be prepared for it. Uh, working with our healthcare providers, working with the public, working with businesses, the faith community, and then really focused on, on testing and contact tracing so that, so that if it ever starts to, to research, whether it's tomorrow, next month or, or six months from now that we're going to know it as, as early as possible uh, and that we won't have the situation uh, that we had uh, several weeks ago. Dr. B, you, you have anything to add to that? So I think that the governor covered a, a lot of the, the ground. You know, what I would add, you know, we're talking about today being a, a day of a lot of milestones. One that occurs to me as you ask your question is if we go back to first or second week of, of uh, coronavirus in the state, um, I think May 15th was about what our original model said would be peak uh, cases. And so it's hard to imagine being here now talking about reopening uh, parts of the um, uh, you know, restaurants and having people going back to um, some aspects of, of uh, you know, life outside of their homes uh, if I put myself back in those shoes there. And I just sort of emphasize that to say we're, we're five months into um, the, the pandemic. It's hard to predict what October looks like. We uh, just distributed um, thousands of vials of a drug that's shown uh, some ability to shorten stay for patients uh, who are in the hospital with coronavirus. And again, that's five months in. So uh, everything that the governor said, uh, I would definitely emphasize, it's just really hard to predict. But that's why we're uh, watching the information so closely. That's why we're trying to communicate regularly with the public. And again, the reason that we're in the position today is also the, the message that we should sort of send to the public about what we can do to anticipate the fall, the more that we wear masks, the more that we stay home when we're sick, we wash our hands, we adhere to the quarantines when we're asked to quarantine under contact tracing, uh, do all of those things, the more that our businesses um, you know, reinforce that and make sure that they're uh, abiding by the phase one uh, guidelines and recommendations, the more likely that we have very few cases when we enter into the fall, and that's the best position to be in, where we're not already fighting fires before we're going into the winter. Leo, before I get to your question, what, what, this is a, a related point, but one that I think bears uh, mentioning. Uh, as we get back into the fall, we would expect, because we always have another flu season as well. Well, the things that we're asking people do, to do to prevent the spread of COVID-19 also prevent the spread of the flu. And when people get the flu and go to the hospital, they're occupying the same acute care beds, ICU beds, ventilators, um, they're demanding the time and attention of the staff and so forth. And so if we do a really good job, we're not going to see uh, nearly as many people go to the hospital with the flu, and that will help if, in fact, we have a resurgence of COVID-19. And so that's another reason why these measures are so important. In fact, one of the things that Alex uh, was able to share with me several weeks ago is that, that we, we actually were still in flu season when we started this public health emergency. And when people started the social distance and wash their hands and not shake hands and, and make contact, the, the number of cases of the flu literally uh, within just a few days started to fall like uh, uh, we've never seen before. And so that's another reason for, for people to, to take these measures very seriously. Leo? We still Well, look, if we see the numbers begin to spike, it's going to depend on how big of a spike, how widespread it is. Uh, does the contact tracing trace it back to specific geographic areas, to specific types of establishments within that geographic area? All of that will inform what we do. Um, and when you say cases per capita continue to be number eight, uh, I'm not sure that if you subtracted out uh, all the COVID-19 confirmed cases because of testing, if you subtracted out of that number, those uh, presumed recovered patients. 
that, that we, you would still have a number that would have us uh, at number eight nationally. And so there's all sorts of ways to look at that. So if you, if you look uh, at the active cases, uh, I don't believe we are there, although I will tell you we have more COVID than I want to have as governor, and I'm not trying to make light of the situation. And as I've always said, I recognize that some percentage of people out there uh, with COVID are also going to be asymptomatic and probably not tested and don't know it and yet still be contagious. And that's, that's what makes this particularly uh, challenging. And I think uh, Dr. Redfield said the other day that, that they, they think that number may be 25%. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a really challenging situation. Um, but we will be monitoring uh, because of the testing, the contact tracing, and if it's necessary, I hope, pray it won't be. If people do what we're asking them to do, it's much more likely that it won't be necessary. But if it becomes necessary, we will take the appropriate measured response at that time. And I don't know what that looks like, so I can't be more specific. Right yes, sir. Now, people are, and some of them police themselves. Have they offered restaurant owners and public places against you know, police themselves in 25 percent? Well, yes, that's that's the limit that they have, and and that that is a, a lawful uh, order that is in place. And so it is incumbent upon them always to, to follow the law. But in this case, it, it will keep uh, the business uh, owner, his employees or her employees uh, safe and, and their customers safe. And so, yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Governor, we understand some sporting events, particularly like youth baseball tournaments mm -hmm. are resuming uh, this weekend and next weekend. Uh, so players are probably okay in a baseball game, but fans, coaches, spectators are a little more difficult for social distance. Should we be playing sports at all right now? And how should fans and parents behave themselves? Well, first of all, uh, as is true, I think generally speaking, outdoor sports are much uh, safer than indoor sports. Uh, Non-contact sports are much safer than contact sports. Uh, baseball can be conducted uh, safely, but the rules still apply. And so we, what we've been saying is if you're outside of your home and you're interacting with people who are not part of your immediate household, you need to be wearing a mask. You need not to be within six feet of any of those other individuals, and you need to engage in proper hygiene. That is true at a baseball game as well. And so what we're expecting to see is that in the bleachers, there will be really good social distancing and that the spectators uh, will be able to bring lawn chairs and, and so forth and spread out and, and, and seat uh, themselves if they choose to be seated down the, the right field uh, foul line or the left field foul line or whatever. And, and look, we, children are um, uh, less susceptible to this disease, but they are not impervious to it. And so we don't want the children uh, to have more contact than is necessary either. So for example, I would encourage coaches not to have them all seated in the dugout at the same time. Uh, when they're in the field, obviously playing defense, that's much easier. When they're at bat, they need to, to be uh, in foul territory, behind the fence, whatever they can do uh, to be safe. But, but the, all of those sorts of things that, that we've been saying apply in this context, and they're all possible uh, with baseball and with softball. Uh, and, and so that, that's what we expect to see. Uh, and, and I will tell you that I think you're going to have a lot of families who will be relieved when their children are able to go out and to participate in baseball and in softball. Uh, but we obviously want them to do so safely. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, first of all, we are looking at all options. Uh, it, during the middle of a public health emergency, such as the one we are having right now with a virus uh, that is contagious, um, non-congregant sheltering uh, is preferred. It isn't always going to be possible, so it will, it will depend. Um, if you go back just a few weeks when we had a, a Monroe uh, tornado, uh, for example, a couple of tornadoes in Washtenaw Parish, uh, they, that tornado destroyed the homes of a number of families. 
those individuals were not placed into congregant shelters, but were rather placed into hotels. Now, depending on the number of people that might need sheltering in a, a uh, hurricane, that may or may not be necessary. And so I can tell you that we are actively um, working at our mass shelter uh, facilities uh, to make sure that we have the ability to at least with respect to a certain segment of the shelter population to, to sort of keep them in, isolated in, in rooms so that they are not making contact with others. And when I say rooms, I'm talking about temporary rooms, similar to what you're seeing at the, um, at the convention center in, in, in uh, New Orleans. And in fact, as we move things out of the convention center in New Orleans, some of those, those tents, those rooms, will be prepositioned and set up in these shelter facilities. Others will be maintained in a warehouse so that we can move them wherever we need them to. Uh, and then we hope to have tremendous flexibility to meet the needs as they arise, either with congregate sheltering in the, in the fashion that I just mentioned, or in non-congregate sheltering uh, with respect to hotels. Um, the other thing that uh, we're working through, and we're having exercises on, on this all the time, uh, because this is this at least as we start this hurricane season is very very different than than previous years is w we have plans where sister states agree to shelter certain uh, numbers of people for us if that becomes necessary well some of that won't be available uh, because of this pandemic and so we're working through all of that the folks at GOSEP uh, they have not uh, had a day off um, since early March and, and working really hard with all our parish OEPs uh, to make sure that we have the best plan possible that is resourced appropriately and that we have the flexibility that we need to be able to respond however uh, we need to respond to meet the needs of the people. I want to thank you all for coming out again. I want to wish everyone a, a wonderful weekend. Please be safe um, out there uh, and, and stay well. And as we go through this first weekend of phase one, I know a lot of people are going to be excited. Um, that includes me, uh, but I'm asking people to make sure that they are uh, responsible. M make sure that, that when you're out, whether you're indoors or outdoors, if you're, if you're interacting with people in close proximity to people who are not part of your household, please make sure you're wearing a mask. Uh, make sure that you keep six feet between yourself and others. Uh, those two things will do tremendous uh, uh, good in terms of stopping the spread of the virus and then wash your hands frequently with soap and water. For those people who are vulnerable, and I know you've heard me say this a thousand times, but it's that important. If you're 65 or older, if you have a chronic comorbid health condition, uh, such as hypertension, diabetes, kidney